Brazil. Um, when, when did you uh, get here anyway? I got here on uh, Sunday, last Sunday. Mm -hmm. What prompted you to come all the way out here? Oh, I'm on my way back to Australia up in America. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, but basically, uh, uh, I'm here to uh, just really look at the music scene. Oh, really? Yeah, just check it out. I'm looking at a few bands. Oh, you yourself? Yeah. Aside from the band. Completely separate from the band. Has it? And I just uh, had my eye on a couple of uh, local people. Um, uh, well, one band I really like is Zelda. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's very, it's very indefinite. You know? All I did was come here. I'm on the way back from Australia, so I just dropped in just to have a look. Mm -hmm. How'd you happen to find that? Um, I had a whole lot of albums uh, delivered to Australia, mm. Japanese albums, and I really liked the way they were looked. I think that the uh, they were like a Japanese, a real Japanese feel about them. As long as they're trying to sound like anybody else, Japanese, they're not trying to do pitch and revival, not mm. really heavy heavy, you know, mm. it's Japanese sound that they're trying to do. I really like to try and develop them. Mm. Like, were you into production before you were a member of uh, Australian Crawl? No, Australian Crawl must have been my, been going for like six years. There were a bit of my production in the scene. I've been heavily involved in all the production I have mm. uh, Plus I've, uh, I've had a few ideas from Australia. A few things I'm, I'm going to get involved in Australia I've never had. Main problem being is the time. Australian tours take up all my time. Actual time to sit down in the studio and interview. I might have the time to sit again now. Even though it is found that tour to survive in Australia, tour almost constantly. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, you're doing it. But it's good, I mean, it's, it's a very healthy uh, scene in Australia. There's lots of places to play, although there are. It's going through a funny period of time, but there's a place to go. But still, any night of the week, you know, you look at the paper and bob, it's like a kind of band. You know. mm. There's so many shows, and uh, it gives the band the ability to just keep working. That's why a lot of Australian bands will say they're really good players because they just play all the time. Mm. I mean, when we first, our first two years, we virtually did straight. We had worked about 300 days a year if not more. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. 600 days a few years and we worked or more. You know, we just worked the whole time. Didn't have a whole lot of speak with the first two years. Is that right? But didn't get there. Not too sure. <laughs> what happened after two years and we got tired. <laughs> you know, it's um then we started to be in the position where we're getting such money we could afford to have time off. And more important than that, you have to because once you've been around this for Australia a couple of times, you've got to be careful about overexposure so mm -hmm. like anywhere. Um, I mean you can only do so many tools as well. Keep doing it, just oversaturate the time. So it gets to the point where you have to have time off. We do tours like twice a year down in Australia. We feel the extensive tours. The rest of the time, although it's off, we'll be basically managing ourselves, so we're still busy getting our off playing, recording, or setting something up, or we're doing something. something mm. Do you actually make money touring, or is it just the way you have to? I thought it might be just a means to maintain a level of certain level of awareness and all. That's it. But you do make, you never become a millionaire. Mm -hmm. It's fine. It's a lot of work. What kind of prices do you, do you charge the doors in the festival? On the doors? Yeah. Eight to ten dollars. Is that right? People are going out now with their amount of money. For us. Or for you. They would, they would do that for us. Like one of the biggest banks in the country. Mm -hmm. But for a small band, um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's been three years since we've been in that situation. And I'm sure the price has gone up a lot since then. I don't know. I suppose between five and 
night, I suppose, depending on who the band is. And a lot of the bands, I'm sure, aren't even on door deals. The pubs have a set price for the door, which would probably be around five or six dollars and stuff. And they pay the band up to the actual fee. Mm -hmm. um, I would imagine doing that much live performance yourself, you're pretty much sick of that, so you don't go out to check out the new bands or the other bands. Well, you do get a bit sick of it. Um, but I'm interested in new music. I'm interested in production, as I've said, so I do make the effort to go out and look at If I think someone's worth going to see, I'll go to see them. I don't like standing in crowds. Mm. Um, but if you know, I'm sure if there's something I want to see, I'll go to see it. You mentioned that the, you were uh, helped quite a bit with the production of, the, of your own records. Uh, the liveliest album was a credit to what Mark Opitz, 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 Opitz. What, his name sounds familiar, right? Well, well, he's done The Divine, which he's done In Excess. Oh, okay. I guess that's, he's done Cold and Chisel. Um, he's done quite a lot of stuff, Angels. So he's just a, a top-notch producer in Australia. Yeah. Does he have any sort of a sound credit to his name? Uh, like, you know, get some of the, well, his approach uh, is very similar to what my what we chose it for, actually. His approach is generally to uh, draw the best out of the musicians rather than putting too much of himself in. So, in as much he doesn't have a set mark over the sound, although you will notice certain things he does mm. if you are really aware of that sort of thing. Well, if you're really aware of, if you're aware of production techniques, you will notice certain things. He does have his own style, of course, but it's probably not as obvious to the layman mm. as it is to someone who's really music. Mm. Listening to your record, it uh, somehow reminded you of In Excess and it has the kind of sound that you would want to hear live. Yeah. As it's well, we, we, uh, we remixed the record ourselves in uh, New York with a guy called Neil Dawson. Mark wasn't involved on that. Hmm. Um, we we labored over the record for a long time and we felt we needed a fresh, fresh input. So he took it to New York and remixed it. A couple of us went over there, remixed it in a power station with this guy, Neil Dawson, hmm. who is a uh, quite a famous producer, uh, not producer, engineer. Hmm. He's never actually produced, but he's engineered things like the Dire Straits records. Hmm. Uh, he's done Bill Bro, Bruce Springsteen, Bob Dylan, mm. lots of stuff. Mm. And it was great working with him because he's he's an engineer, he's not a producer, but he's just a, he's a really good guy to get along with and he knows how to get good sound. Does it make that much difference? It makes well if you if you could hear the difference. Um, nothing against Mark, but just I mean, as circumstances were, I still think Mark's a fantastic producer. Mm. But uh, as I said, it needed a fresh set of ears hmm. when it got to that point. If you could hear the point, the mix that Mark did opposed to Neil's, you would hmm. notice it was incredible. Is that right? Yeah. It seems a lot of the Australian bands do that, cut an album back home, take it to New York or LA, and remix it. For a lot of reasons, I'd imagine. Um, usually, I'd imagine it would be the producer they're working with. Hmm. Although, often, um, I mean, there's not that many good studios in Australia, so if they're booked out, you've got to go somewhere. <laughs> um, also, there's something, um, I suppose, a certain promotional value to be gained from an Australian band doing working on their product mm. in a place like New York or mm. Los Angeles. Mm. I guess an establisher of an edge from other bands. Yeah. Right, also, well, being there, any any chance you can get to go to a place like that is an invaluable experience mm. because you get to meet the sort of people who are going to be, if you've got a release happening over there, you're going to meet the people who are going to promote your record, you're going to meet the journalists, you're going to meet just the age agency people, just the, you know, just the industry people in general. And that's, and that's invaluable. Mm. And if you're going to have a success anywhere, it's really important to create some sort of, uh, it really helps so much, it's just ridiculous that you get to have a personal relationship with the people who are going to be involved with the career. You know, mm. It gives them this sort of incentive going away over so these guys are friends of mine, I'll push their records with. Mm. Mm. It's a valuable experience. Mm. It's interesting. 
a lot of the Australian bands say that it's almost impossible for non-Australians to understand a lot of the lyrical content. Looking through the lyrics here, I noticed actually quite a few songs that are kind of hard to figure out. Mm -hmm. uh, is this very uh, Australian-like, or is it just my? Well, I mean, it's it's the songs are written about experiences we have. I suppose most of those experiences are in Australia, so yeah, of course, there's a certain amount of uh, localization about to lyrics. There's certain things which uh, a lot of people would find hard to understand. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we're finding now we're traveling a lot. We're going to America quite a lot. A lot of the songs that are starting to be written now are being written about experiences in America. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure when we come to Japan as a band, mm -hmm. we'll start writing songs about our experiences in Japan. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, it's just, you write things about the circumstances around you. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we'll probably find a more international flavor as we go along. Mm -hmm. They seem to be rather tongue-in-cheek. I guess it's the work of this J. Rain. Uh, is that James, yeah. yeah. Uh, it seems rather humorous sometimes. It's just a mistake I'm looking for. No, it's, it's a lot of the lyrics are tiny shit. Hmm. We're fairly, we're, although we're very serious about what we do, we don't take it too seriously, if that makes sense to you. Yeah. We're very, very dedicated and committed to our careers. But at, at the same time, you can't take it too seriously. Hmm. I mean, you can't take, you know, that whole rock industry is, is, you know, as it is got to stay a little bit removed for it and treat it as a bit of a joke mm. because it is you know, mm. I mean, it's great but it's, it's you can't take it seriously mm. you can't really take the yeah. whole idolization thing seriously you know, you've got to stand off a little bit mm. Mm. Uh, a lot of the Australian bands I talk to say they go from Australia straight to America to try to make it there first and then maybe the rest of the world um, they usually say the biggest problem is logistic, in that there's not enough money or there's not enough time to, to, to crack the foreign market. Um, could it also be, uh, say, a difference in uh, the way the average fan in America approaches the music, and it, as opposed to the way the average Australian fan approaches the music? Possibly. It's a bit difficult for me to say at this stage, having not really been... I mean, I've been to America three times and spent a bit of time there, but I'm still, I still couldn't say I'm really au fait with the American, young American culture, you know, mm -hmm. I think, uh, but to a certain extent, in Australia we're saturated with it, mm -hmm. with movies and things, mm -hmm. and records, you know, but you don't really understand until you get there, mm -hmm. you know, so um, there certainly are some very uh, you know, big differences between Australian youth and American youth, for, for example. Um, Um, I don't know, it's, it's uh, the area you grow up in obviously has an incredible influence yeah. on how you are, yeah. you know? and I mean there's that whole, you know, like the whole Valley Girl thing, you know, the yeah. California beach scene, you know, it's a whole, it's a whole frame of mind, New York, I mean, God, I mean, that's just an extreme place, you know, Australians, not many Australians would, would have the faintest idea of understanding how a New York youth mind would work unless they go there and even mm. then I don't think they could mm. totally understand it. Mm. You know, it's, the difference is fairly obvious. I mean, if you imagine, I'm sure you're familiar with New York growing up in a place like you know, New York as opposed to growing up on the beach in Sydney. Mm -hmm. I mean, the difference is fairly obvious. How about yourself? Where did you go? Well, I grew up on the beach in Melbourne. But mm. the band, three of us went to school together. We all grew up in a place called Mount Eliza, which is a... Uh, Class beach suburb south of Melbourne. Mm. Um, the other two, well, one other guy actually went to the same school, but he was a couple years ago. Mm. Is there a lot of local color associated with bands, like Melbourne bands like this, Sydney bands like this, Queens, you know, whatever bands like this? Not really, not that I can think of. Like, that's a typical Sydney band. Those are things that typical part. What happens with the Melbourne, with the Australian music scene? It tends to, uh, it works in a funny way for some reason, and I don't think there really is a reason, it's just the way it is. 
uh, a lot of bands will come out of Sydney at one point in time. The focus of attention in the music industry will be on Sydney. Mm. Then it seems to shift to Melbourne. Mm. The focus of attention will shift with that. Suddenly five bands are coming to Melbourne. Mm. And six bands are coming out of Sydney. And four bands are coming to Melbourne. Because it goes, I know the answer is over a period of couple of years, something it just shifts back and forth. But there doesn't seem to be any identifiable difference in the sound. With the exception, exception perhaps that when the punk thing happened, which is a long time ago now, it tended to be more centred towards Sydney. Mm. And it, tended to, it tends to still, there's, it's much bigger there now still. It's totally died out of the moment. There's still a new wave influence. Mm. I mean, punk is now written past over the present word. Sydney is still punks, it's still very hardcore, mm. Mohican haircut, mm. you know, King's Road punks. Uh, it's, um, so in that respect, I mean, it's still gained that sort of, it's still retained, sorry, that sort of aspect of the, the music, which is not directly related to music happening now as the music it was. Mm. Where punk was big. Mm. Interesting, you mentioned that. Get to talk to a lot of different musicians, and all the, the young British ones now, almost without exception, have gone for the same thing. They started off on glam rock, went to punk, and now they're doing, you know, uh, sort of I don't know if you call it new wave, but they're you know just new music. Yeah, yeah the new music, the, you know, the Duran Durans, the Thomas Dolby's, the Midnight Runners, all these guys. Then again, the Americans. You, Punk was just something limited to probably to what, maybe San Francisco away in New York. And it wasn't even very big there. It was not a good fashion for a while. But also glam rock was almost zilch, you know, did nothing. You have a whole different range of experiences and milestones in musical history. What about in Australia? What were the like the big the big moments for yourself? Big moments for yeah, for like the big change, turning points I should say. LA music. You know, that West Coast sound is that right? was really big. Is that right? It was, yeah. I mean, it was, uh, you know, it was bands like Little River Band mm -hmm. involved and you know, the influence mm -hmm. derived from that area. Mm -hmm. That was probably, scratching my memory now, I think that was probably directly before the punk movement happened mm -hmm. in the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, and the punk new wave became all the thing. Hmm. And uh, the British bands were really big before the LA bands, I think. I mean, there's always the Deep Purples and Black Sabbaths, Slade, hmm. um, Queen, have always been fairly, maintained fairly successful history throughout. Um, the same, and it's always, out of those fads, there's always somebody comes out who's influenced by what's going on at the time, it's really got something substantial to say, hmm. and they always circumstance notwithstanding they tend to always uh, be there mm. you know they've got something important to say they're good at what they do they're a good example of what they do and they'll always be there mm. you know like uh, I'm trying to think of an example but um, uh, there's probably like XTC you know, came from the punk thing yeah um, and they kept going you know. yeah but they're just, just barely hanging on right now well, they've got a new album which is uh, critically very well acclaimed. Yeah, well, yeah. 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 yeah, very well in Australia, and it seems to be in America as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably a heat fellow, but it's, I can't really think of any of the top of my head. But this, you know, you know, <coughs> whenever there's a whenever there's a new fad in music or a new direction, but the bands that, and the generally, I suppose, the bands that initiate this one. The ones that have really got something substantial to say, surpass the fashion and you know, change and stuff, and they keep going. Mm. Was, were the Beatles Genesis in Australia as they were in America? I forget who it was. Mm. Is, that, is that what you yourself started out on? Uh, well, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, I started listening to music. Uh, I played classical music until I was like 10. I was played classical violin. Like when you're 10 years old and going to a, a grammar school, it's really uncool to play classical violin. <laughs> so I, um, I gave that up 
and I just didn't listen to anything until I turned about 15. Was I, it I, yeah, I started listening to music again. Okay. I got right into the Beatles a bit later than everybody else. Mm -hmm. but then I started to get really into bands, you know, like Deep Purple and those things. Oh, mm -hmm. And then I just, uh, from there on, I, my music, musical tastes were fine. You know, mm -hmm. So what, when were you 15? Well, I'm 27 now. So that's a, Seventy-two. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Started in the early sixties. There. The music you do now seems like it's completely something new to me. I mean, there's little elements of the police, slightly depending, and you hear that a lot in a lot of the bands now. Mm -hmm. They were very significant when they first came out. Yeah. So that's a very important point. So that's sort of getting back to what I was saying before. They're a band that came out of the new wave, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but for the right reasons, mm. you know, they didn't dress up and litter and you know, their hair, you know, shaved because it looked good or anything like that, and or play loud music because you know, of, of any other reason that, that they not that they played loud music. But they they played the music they played simply because they believed in it, not mm. because they took it from somebody else. Mm. And they were bands that survived. Mm. Bands staying together six years is uh, not very common these days. No, probably five, six on the tissue, I'm trying to sort of straight what keeps you time. What keeps you together? We sort of always progress. I think we've been pro progressing. I mean, that's when a band finishes, when they stop progressing. Mm. If they're true to themselves, you know, unless mm. they keep going for the money. Mm. Uh, the, the band, the life of the band is such that it runs parallel with their, uh, how they grow as musicians. Mm. And we're, Mm. Mm. Uh, we've, uh, it's a new frontier now, the international thing. We've reached as far as we can go in Australia. And uh, the American thing's looking very good. Mm. And uh, it's a whole new frontier, so I mean, it's obvious incentive to keep going. Mm. What do you think will be the best, uh, the, 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 the problems that uh, keep you from making it abroad? If any, not what you don't see anything. <laughs> Well, of course, there are problems. I don't know. It's, it's. I think it's just a hit and miss situation. I mean, everything's going for us now. We've got a really good record company in Geffen Records, mm -hmm. which is different through CBS here. Um, I mean, they're, they're probably the most exclusive record company in the world. They're really, really into the band. They've given us an amazing deal. Mm -hmm. We've got manage, management now by uh, champion management, Tommy Mottola, and uh, managers for notes, and he's incredibly keen on the band. Mm -hmm. He's probably one of the most powerful men in America. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, we've got the agencies, we've got a choice of agency. We met with all the agencies while we were, they were, we were in Los Angeles and they were very keen on the band. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got everything going for us and it's just a matter of now whether the public likes us or not, basically. Mm -hmm. We're going to get, I know we're going to get the best shot at it. Mm -hmm. And it's just basically now up to fate. If it's meant to happen, it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. What do you think has stopped all the other Australian bands except man what from really making it though? Well, largely to fail them. You know, you've got to, it's got so many things, you've got to have talent, of course, but then you've got to be in the right place at the right time, you've got to have the right guy doing work working for you. I mean, if you've got some guy who's a real jerk going for record companies and going, you know, you've got to push these bands because you know, it's bad because they're my band, they're great, you know, and really hassling them. If you don't do that in the right way, it can really push them up, you know, rub them up the wrong way, and they will just forget about you. We had a, an album released in America uh, in it, through um, another record company, which I remember the name, <laughs> and um, for whoever's fault it was, whether it was theirs or whose, I don't know, but it never, just did nothing. It did absolutely nothing. It just died and it, you know, didn't get any response. Um, Unless you've got everyone working for you. Uh, so it's like I say, it's just a combination of so many things. You know, timing, you know, people, the music, the, the attitude the band has. Is it the same way in Australia? What accounts for a successful band in Australia? The same thing, but on not a greater scale, I suppose. Mm. I mean, you've got to have the right things going for you. Mm. Um, but it, I mean, the, just that step from Australia to America is such a big one. It's mm. just all those things that, again, contribute to your success in Australia means so much more when you're trying to break that extra market. Hmm. Is there an ill feeling towards the, the bands that make it at all? I heard that Rick Springfield tried to 
we'll do a tour back there at the end of last year and uh, couldn't sell any tickets and had to cancel. Well, he's never really been anything in Australia. I mean, sure, he's big in America, yeah. General Hospital, but mm. I mean, he's had Jesse's girls of reasonably good success, but he's never really, uh, he just he's forgotten about it. It was his mistake. I think he just, whether it means anything to him or not, he just, he never paid Australia much attention, so he couldn't really expect it to, in all honesty, to pay him attention back. Well, what Australia really think of a guy that is, who speaks just like an American, you would never guess he was. I'd, I'd, I'd say, what, what's the, a lot of people from didn't realize he was Australian. Yeah, yeah. I, nobody in America would have really. No. Um, I mean, I'm not saying anything against Rick Springfield, and I, don't, I don't think of that, to be honest, but um, he's, um, he, w he wouldn't have sold tickets in Australia for that very reason, mm -hmm. the same as you know, any, any, anybody else who never had success in Australia would have never sold tickets. Mm. Because I wouldn't have heard of it. It's as simple as that. Mm, yeah. So, I mean, uh, most Australians, I suppose, would be familiar with his name, but mm -hmm. they wouldn't really, you know, mm. unless they were into Jesse's Girl, which is about his only real success there. Mm. Uh, and it's a long time since he had that out. Mm. They wouldn't go to see his concert. You know? mm. Why would they? Hmm. As soon as I hear that nationalism, nationalism was running rather uh, high in Australia. Well, there is, a, there is, a, there's always this thing in Australia where they're the, they're the number one supporter of the underdog. Mm -hmm. They're right behind you mm -hmm. until you get there, and then sometimes in certain areas there's a bit of backlash against you. You know, mm -hmm. if successful, particularly if you don't play it right. You know, if, if you if you forget about those people who have got you where you are. Australians really take that badly. You know, mm. They want and want to know about you. Um, I mean, there are a few cases where that's happened, mm. um, but that's something that's very important over there. Once once you've been successful, if you disregard your home market, don't expect to get it back again. <laughs> so, right. Just how big are you guys there? How, how many can you draw at maximum? Well, we've got house records. I think dispersed all over the country. Is that right? Have Probably up to a hundred thousand people at one show. Is that right? We do stadium shows in Australia. Yeah, yep. we do. Uh, we don't call them stadiums. We have this play this place called My Music Bowl. Middle is a free concert, but we did get about a hundred thousand people. There. We don't have any problem selling out uh, anywhere we play. Hmm. We've sold more records there than just about anywhere. Hmm. What's it like for a rock group? There's a lot of TV in it, and it's just live. Uh, lives are important. It's a very healthy, healthy um, scene in Australia. There's, there's quite a few rock shows on television. Mm -hmm. There's about three or four uh, on the national ones. You know, every city has its own. Oh, really? You know, there's a couple of TV shows that are unique to particular cities. Like Adelaide's got a couple, I think. Um, Brisbane's got a couple. Mm -hmm. um, most of Melbourne are Sydney shows are national. Mm -hmm. Some of the smaller towns have their own shows. Um, and that's very important. There's one show called Countdown, mm -hmm. which is particularly important. Oh, really? Yeah. That can almost make or break a single. Is that right? For a new band. Well, yeah. they just count on a top ten or something? Well, yeah, but they're fairly, they're fairly progressive, and, and the guy there who runs it, Ian Meldrum, who's the, like the host of the show, he does a lot of research. Mm -hmm. He's really into breaking up. He put the... Uh, a demo take on Countdown once. With some, mm. with some uh, friends of ours, you know, he, he'll he's into helping people if he thinks they've got something to offer. Mm. Very healthy scene in Australia. Is that like on prime time TV there in Hong Kong? Yeah, well it's on it's on the the, the government station, mm -hmm. but it's like six o'clock on a Sunday night. Oh, and on Saturday night as well now. So it's it's a fairly popular program. Mm. So the band bands work hard to try to make it on that show then. Particularly young bands, um, you know, it, it, as I can, as I say, it can make or break a first single, and certainly help with subsequent singles. Hmm. Hmm. And you guys have, of course, done that several times. Yeah, I guess countless times. <laughs> I hear that the, all the Australian bands get along rather well. Is there a lot of? Is there an artistic community there? Or community? Yeah, there is. I had this discussion the other day with somebody, but it was tending towards the other side of the coin. The, um, there's not 
as much communication as it seems to be in America. In America, you see a lot of guys playing on other people's records. Yeah, yeah. You do that. You do see that in Australia. And I suppose a lot of it's because it's so much smaller, but uh, not as much. Uh, I mean, we've all got a lot of friends in the music industry. A lot of other bands we're close and quite friendly with. Mm. Uh, it's very competitive, though. Hmm. Is that right? There's not that much uh, artistic exchange now. There is a bit, hmm. but. Uh, it doesn't seem to be quite as much uh, as the States. On a percent, mm. Of course, it's not as much, but on a percentage level, it doesn't seem to be quite as much mm. communication between musicians as there is in the States. Mm. Um, although there is to a certain degree. Yeah. I think it could be a bit healthy in that respect. Mm. What do you suppose that is? Because there's just a massive place. Well, no, it's, it's not that massive, really. Well, it is, I mean, it's huge, yeah. but it's the East Coast is where it's all at. Oh, that's where here. I mean, Melbourne and Sydney are the music centres, mm-hmm. musical centres of the country, and they're, they're only an hour's flight apart. And that's basically where it all happens. Mm-hmm. A lot of bands do come out of small cities, but they always live in Melbourne City. Can the biggest, uh, I don't know whether or not you guys have the greatest drawing power in Australia, but can the greatest Australian act outdraw a foreign act? A big yeah. Foreign? Sometimes. Sometimes. I can't think of any particular case, but uh, I know it's the case. I, I, I know it is the case that sometimes uh, you know, a big Australian act will, will like, sell out more concerts than someone who's really big from overseas. Mm. Depending on, I mean, someone like um, Michael Jackson, I think it'd be hard to beat at the moment. But <laughs> um, you know, like the, the, they do support their own bands. Very, 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 very strongly indeed. You know, I mean, you you will, if you're popular there, you will do very well live. Hmm. Yeah. Is, is there? A, there's no sort of inferiority complex right now. Like Most Australians are very proud of them. Uh-huh. Very proud of Australian bands. You uh-huh. get you get a lot overseas. A lot you find Australians really, uh, sort of really yeah. speaking well of yeah. their local bands and trying to create as much interest as as they can, you know, just laying to go overseas. I mean, I've heard from so many people, you go to America and say, oh, this Australian friend, he just won't stop playing these Australian cool albums, you know, won't stop playing these split ends albums, you know. Australia's very proud of the uh, that mm. Well, you know, obviously listening to the record and I heard all the, all the Australian stuff, you can tell that, you know, there's absolutely no difference. And this morning, among the people, you know, saying, well, you know, they're good and all, but you know, they're, they're still Australian. You know, no, I think that was the case maybe 10 years ago, but it's certainly not the case now. Oh, really? Mm. What changed at all? Was it, was it I don't know. It sort of happened before I was really paying attention to that sort of stuff. Oh, really? But I, I think, I mean, I, I seem to remember that, I remember I used to feel anyway, speaking for myself, I used to think Australian band, you know, okay, they're a successful Australian band, but they are an Australian band, mm-hmm. but I get really excited about an American band mm-hmm. in Australia. But now it's not the case, I don't think. You think it could be that your own case because you have come this far? How about for the average uh, I still think for the average person, they're still really proud of Australian music. They don't, they don't feel uh, anything but, but pride for it, really. Mm-hmm. You know, they're quite you know, willing to say to anybody mm. their favourite Australian band. How important is the music to the young people there? I mean, you say Very. You know, all, all these uh, clubs all over the city, mm-hmm. what are, the, are most of the young kids just spending their nights out at uh, listening to music? Or the they must, you know, because the gigs still keep going. <laughs> yeah. And Australia's only got a population of like 14 million. Yeah. Uh, so it's not, you know, it hasn't got a hell of a lot of people. Although they are basically centred, you know, very definable areas, Melbourne and Sydney being the two biggest. Um, but uh, Australians are very, they do go out a lot. Mm. You know, the, the tenants at, at most pubs, we call them pubs, you'd call them hotels, and, uh, or you'd call them clubs, I suppose. Mm. Well, you know, it's, you know, most, most bands get a, a, a big enough audience to support them working and probably make a bit of profit every night of the week. Hmm. What do you expect from foreign artists? Like you, you, know, you shoot your tree a certain way in Australia and you probably think, well, if we ever 
play America or whoever played Japan, we probably won't get this that we get from Australian audiences. Or do you have any expectations? Well, I think of it, um, in terms of America anyway, I've heard it's different in Japan. But in America, I've heard that, uh, I mean, in America, I expect I'll, I think we'll go over really well, personally. You know, I think, um, I can't see any reason why we wouldn't. I know Americans are a very enthusiastic race of people by nature. Once they get interested in something, it's, they're very, very enthusiastic. I think that will show. Uh, I can't see any reason why we won't be as, as successful in America as, as we are in Australia, and therefore draw the same type of, crow of crowds and get the same enthusiastic response as we do in Australia. Is there anything you think you could do abroad that you couldn't do in Australia? Make more money. <laughs> <laughs> How about in, ter in terms of the audience itself? You, I, I'm sure you have certain dissatisfactions with your Australian audience as well. So, geez, oh, really, Australian audiences are great. They're so enthusiastic for us. You know, we we did a show with the police mm -hmm. in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't. You know, that's one of the few bands we'd support there. Mm -hmm. uh, we got such an overwhelming response. Mm -hmm. you know, it was about as good as the police. You know, we just right? you know, huge response. That was an outdoor show, and I don't know how many people were there, but it was. Tens of thousands, you know, tens and tens, we something like 50,000. Mm. Mm. And we got an immense response. You know, Australian audience is fantastic, but no criticism of them, of them at all. Was that right? Mm. Mm. That's great. Did you learn anything from the police there? Like that? That was a bad one, but yeah, no, nothing was really new to us. You know, we, I love the police. I thought they were great. Mm. Uh, I thought they were very entertaining. Played really well. Mm. Um, but no, there's nothing really that springs to mind that we hadn't really been aware of before. Do you handle your audience differently from the foreign acts did? We're perhaps a little more familiar with them. You know, they, I mean, obviously we're more familiar with them, but we treat them with more familiarity. You know, we, mm. you know, it's more like, I suppose it's an easier sort of atmosphere between the two. Mm. You can yell things out of the Australianisms. That yeah. We'll go over the big yeah. Hmm. Hmm. It's interesting. Um, uh, I should ask you what the plan is going to be for the band then. Yeah. Well, basically we're uh, considering uh, spending a bit of time in New York, mm. playing around, probably around about May. Mm. Uh, then we'll pick up a big tour there, tour America, and probably doing like the nights off in each particular capital city will still work and uh, just work around the whole country basically mm. with a big act but doing gigs by ourselves um, and basically we just have to take it from there mm. we'll come back to Australia via Japan probably I think we'll probably be here July or August but that mm. could change because you know, it just totally depends on what happens with the record yeah, with what happens with the record you know, record was released last Monday in America and uh, it's had a couple of good previews uh, but we just have to wait to see what the reaction to the songs is you know what the re reaction to the single is what the reaction once we start touring is before we can make any definite plans about our future mm. well it seems like the, the charts are rather staggered right now the top 20 or so is just not moving it's just sitting there it's just sitting there uh, everything's sounding about the same mm -hmm. um, I imagine that's uh, somewhat of a worry although the Economy has picked up quite a can bit. kind of work for you though. I mean, it looks like it's just sitting there waiting for something new to happen. <laughs> That's what we're hoping the reason is. You know, could, although it is a very mixed bag right now. Mm -hmm. You've got you know, Michael Jackson on top of the van here on seven. Every you know, every rack is a different genre of music. Right. And, uh, there's no, I'm listening to the album. There's, no, there's nothing really like yours. <coughs> That's why we're hoping it'll, it'll work for us because. Uh, well, it's very difficult for, for us to be objective about our own music. It's very difficult for us to say we sound like nobody else because mm -hmm. you know, who knows? You're so familiar with the stuff. Yeah. Um, plus, the influence influences of other people mm -hmm. in our music is obvious to us, mm -hmm. you know, wherever they may be. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very difficult for us to be objective about our music, but we just hope for the best. You know, we mm -hmm. just hope that we are different enough to create. Um, a need or something. I don't know. So out of curiosity, have you uh, contacted Zelda yet? <laughs> um, yeah, I had a meeting with him yesterday. Oh, really? 
Yeah. What, uh, what, what was the outcome of that? Uh, I think we all walked away a little confused. <laughs> it's very difficult here because of the language. <coughs> I had an interpreter there mm. and she did the best she could, but it's, it's very difficult for them to understand too, I think, what exactly I'm trying to tell them. You know, what are you trying to tell them? Though? Well, just that I'm interested in, in developing Japanese music mm -hmm. um, and making it commercially successful, which has never, as I said, really been done before with a couple of small exceptions. Mm. Um, I don't know if they can really grasp what I'm saying. Mm. Having heard their sound, how would you change it, if at all? Um, I wouldn't want to change it too much, uh, but the difference would be very obvious. Oh, really? <laughs> I mean, because uh, I really uh, believe in production. You have to draw out of the artist what they have. And it's pointless going in there and saying, okay, play this like that, you know, because it's part of you. And it's to, be, to produce someone well, I think you've got to really know how to draw um, the best out of them. Mm. And uh, I mean, there's obvious things which where I'd be contributing in terms of sound. But I mean, I'd, I'd be treating it from the bass drum up saying, I don't think this is working, what can you offer me that does? Mm. Um, in concrete terms, I think that music would sound more structured. Um, uh, I'd give them, in my opinion, what a better sound. Mm. Uh, you know, just pure sounds, guitar sounds, drum sounds, etc., etc. Uh, and I'd concentrate on uh, the melodies, making the vocal lines really strong and clear. Mm. The problem being, again, is the um, language difficulties. They're very keen on singing in Japanese. Mm. I don't know how that's going to work in Australia. See, it's, that, see, I don't know if they quite understand how, understandably, I mean, they live here, they've never been to Australia, how uh, Australian and Western audiences in general, uh, you know, what they expect from the band mm. and what they've grown to expect, what they've mm. been subjected to. Uh, so if I do decide to do it, or if we do something, they haven't agreed to it either. I mean, they may say, you know, we don't want to know about you, and that's fine. But um, if it does happen, it's not going to be easy. Mm. But, uh, you know, it just remains to be seen. But I really like, I think it's time someone tried to develop Japanese music in mm. a way, because it's, it's really is, you know, like it's worlds apart. Mm. You know, there's, there's Japanese bands that play their interpretation of Western music, like the heavy metal bands, yeah. the rock and roll revival bands. But that's not Japanese music, you know, it's Western music. I, but I really like an identifiable Japanese sound to start happening, because I think, you know, there's a place for it. Mm. But it, it does, certain compromises have to be made uh, with that, while, while still retaining the essence of the Japanese music. There's certain things about the West that are good to learn. I mean, it's good to be able to do these things. So that's going to be the hard part, trying to marry the two different cultures musical concerts. Hmm. Well, it should be interesting. Probably, I would imagine you'll have to aim for the novelty market, though. Well, no, I don't want to do that. Hmm. I, that I mean, that, that would be the easy way of doing it. Yeah. Because, I mean, say, say Zelda, and, um, as a case in point, they're very pretty young girls. They look fantastic, I think. I mean, they've got a great look. It's very Japanese look, you know, but it's not it's not novelty to me. Hmm. To me, novelty would be if they got on stage with kimonos and some, you know, <laughs> something like you know, some Japanese pop song, you know, that's novelty. To me, uh, that's, what I'm tr that's the whole basic thing I'm trying to do is make something substantially Japanese, mm. you know, that, that's quite credible and people will appreciate musically mm. and visually, um, mm. but not relying on the novelty value. Mm. I mean, that would be easy to do, but I don't want to do that. Is there much awareness in Japan and Australia? Well, that's the thing, I mean, at the moment, and I've got to be careful because I've had this idea for a while, and I don't want to be late, because <laughs> at the moment it's at its peak. Japanese music, uh, not so much Japanese music, but Japanese uh, art, Japanese uh, clothing, very big Japanese clothing, Japanese restaurants are popping up everywhere. Is that right? Oh yeah. It's what's, very the, what's behind the big fat? It's just the way things go, you know. It's, yeah. you know it's, it's very difficult to say how something like that snowballs, but that's exactly what it does, you know. It's something starts, you know, like it's... Japanese fashion, I suppose, would have to be the thing that spearheaded the whole thing because yeah. Japanese designers now all over the world have become very, very popular, very fashionable. New York, Paris, London, mm. they've all got Japanese shops, LA, mm -hmm. and Melbourne now, uh, Sydney, I'm sure every capital in the world has now got Japanese clothing stores. Mm. Very expensive, very exclusive, great clothes. And I think that's probably the thing, that the single thing that's pushed the 
whole Japanese awareness, or is pushing the Japanese awareness. But uh, um, without cashing in on it, I'd like to take advantage of the present Japanese climate to um, to try and develop Japanese music. I might totally fail, but <laughs> I mean it's something I'd really like to give a go because uh, a I see a need for it, and b I'm really into Japan. Yeah. Well, I'm sure they'd uh, they'd welcome you with open arms here because uh, yeah, it's the same with Japanese bands. They can't really make um, that much of a living here mm. just by playing music. Right. Unfortunately, one of the girls in Zelda is an actress as well. Oh really? Yeah, she's an actress. I mean, I didn't originally know. an actress. Which one's one, that? One of them's named June. She's a singer. Uh, I think so. She has a real frail look. She's very singer. pale. Yeah, it's, 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 I mean, it's just very interesting meeting yesterday because it was just, I'm sure it was baffling as for them as it was for me. I walked out of there just totally confused. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, but uh, I'm meeting with them again tomorrow. Oh. So hopefully I'll be able to sort of contribute some musical, just a few ideas just to bounce off them to see how they... Yeah. They're very, very cautious. They don't, they don't want their music prostituted, I think. But that's mm. the last thing I want to do. I just want to try and help them develop what I see is, I see them having a sound, I'm just trying to develop it. And the first one might, the first attack, if you like, the first thing we go with overseas would have to be very, we have to perhaps compromise a little too much mm. just to create the initial attention. Mm. And that's one reason why I'm going with a girl band, because mm. I think it's going to be easier for them to be accepted than a guy, a band of guys, because they're so cute, you know. Yeah. And while I don't want to play on the novelty thing, you've got to use it to a certain degree just to catch the attention. Mm. And then you can offer them something substantial to listen to. Mm. But, I mean, it's not going to be easy, but hopefully it'll work. Mm. It will be interesting. But that band Sandy and the Sunsets, I believe, will, will do They've an opening act for yeah. an excess one. Back they also had a single, Sticky Music, which is quite successful. Oh, really? She's not Japanese. Though. Yeah, right. <laughs> She's American. Actually. And it's, it's also the music's. It's not really Japanese music either. You know, it's great. It's, I like it. I think it's great. But it's... I don't know if I've got... I don't know if I'm totally misled, but I'm hoping that there's a, a Japanese sound that we mm. can develop. And I don't think Sandy is it. It doesn't matter in the least. It's still a great song. She's still great. The band's still great. I wish them all success in the world. But I don't think it's um, what I personally am looking forward to develop. Mm. We've got to bear in mind that a lot of the kids here are raised on nothing but Western music. Mm. Japanese music is something they have, might have nothing to do with. Exactly. So they're just like you and the me. Insurmountable problems now. That, well, hopefully they're not going to be insurmountable. But there's a lot of problems there, mm. but I'm hoping we can deal with them. Oh, well, best of luck to you. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot for your time. No problem. Uh, just under 40, 40 minutes.